It's not often that creepypasta break out of their shells online. In fact, there's almost a stigma to creepypasta being amateur fictional stories written by people who don't really know what they're doing. Of course, there are some major exceptions. Some of these internet urban legends have gone on to become titular characters in gigantic Hollywood productions, such as the case for Slenderman. Some passionate writers really do go above and beyond with their stories giving us internet horror icons such as The Rake or Ben Drowned. And though the stories don't have to be good in order to get famous, <coughs> Sonic.exe, <coughs> the people that put their heart and soul into the stories tend to have their stories perform well. Well enough to have fan-made video games, web series, and even cults in some extreme cases. My personal favorite creepypasta is the story of NES Godzilla by Cosby Def. Now, the story isn't the subject of this video, so for those who are unaware, I will catch you up to speed. <clears throat> Bought this game at a garage sale. Funny squid. No. Wow, this wasn't in the original. Not punch. There's a red spider monster. Middle school girlfriend got nanade. Every copy is personalized. Middle school girlfriend is in the game. Jump scare, by the way. No, not that jump scare, this one. I might die in real life. The day is saved. Now that that's over with, I'm going to give away the video game that I know has the soul of my middle school girlfriend on it because it reminds me that I have zero game, and I'm still hung up over someone I knew from middle school. Anyways, now that you're completely 100% nothing missed caught up with the story, let's take a look at the actual playable game that came from it. There exists a fan creation of NES Godzilla Online, which seeks to replicate everything from the creepypasta and turn it into an actual playable experience. And not only does it succeed, but it adds its own stuff and improves on everything Cosby Daff had written. The NES Godzilla game notifies you that something is wrong as early as the title screen, having the cover strobe red and slowing the music down considerably. From there, it's pretty straightforward. Go straight to the journey, skip the intro cutscene out of impatience, and as a wise man once said, Grab yourself a snack and a glass of orange juice, and try not to reach through the screen because here we go! From there, you can play as Godzilla or Mothra going through and wreaking havoc on all the small, insignificant life forms. One thing that you'll notice is that Mothra sucks. Mothra is a slight downgrade from Godzilla. She'll get pushed back by pretty much anything and does tiny damage, and only has some niche advantages over Top G. Godzilla. The first boss of the game is Gazora. This giant cephalopod does a neat little trick and pulls the most insane infinite you've ever seen, breaking the screen and booting you out to the overworld. From there, there's nothing much of note, and the rest of Earth can be played as normal. That brings us to the second planet, Mars. Mars, like Earth, also starts off as standard, aside from one notable difference. Where Varen once stood, now stands Titanosaurus. Gameplay-wise, Mars is also the exact same, aside from the bosses. Gizora can no longer do his broken infinite, but when he dies, he splurges all over the screen. Which leads us to the first part where the actual playable game differentiates from the creepypasta. Where Gazora once stood is now a mess of red pixels. Passing that tile will take you through a brand new level, one with a black hole, a scrambled UI, the slowed Mars theme, and annoying indestructible purple shurikens. And just so you know, getting gobbled by the black hole is instant death. At the end of the level is a purple rock Gazora, who doesn't move and does nothing but attack with a tentacle. One killed, Gazora erupts into an explosion of red eyes, and the level returns to normal. Mogira is also messed up, in that he is a, and forgive me for saying this, a heckin' chonker. <coughs> saying that physically hurt me. When he dies, he does a reference that was epic in 2018. Also, this isn't really all that important to mention, but in the original creepypasta, when Mogira gets dusted, there's a little birdie in a cage at the top right of the screen, which isn't present here. And then we have Titanosaurus, which is an entirely new enemy in the creepypasta and in the game. And may I just say, the sprite work in the game is gorgeous. There's been a huge glow up in between his appearance in the creepypasta and in the game. Titanosaurus and Godzilla have pretty similar movesets, but Titanosaurus can also shoot little beams from its horn and use this giant sonic wave attack that cooks you if you get caught in it. Now, if you're at all familiar with the creepypasta, then you know after Titanosaurus is when things take a really, really dark turn. Welcome to Pathos. Instead of taking you to Jupiter like the game normally would, you take a wrong turn to a planet called Pathos, 
where Jupiter is green, Pathos is a cold, dark blue. Literally the entire thing. This is where things get interesting. The board is now almost completely covered with blue rocks. The music, just as the creepypasta says, changes tempo and tone every 12 seconds with a loud crash. From what I can tell, there are six different songs that it plays, and I'll play them here for you now. The first levels are simple and set the tone perfectly. The blue mountains are vacant and uncomfortable. In the beginning levels, there's not a single thing to run into. No enemies, no mountains, absolutely nothing. It's just you. From this layout, you can tell something is terribly wrong. And no, I'm not just talking about the giant red moon with a soon-to-be familiar face on it. Up to this point, the game has been fast-paced and chaotic, but this? It's just a slow walk through a landscape that shouldn't even exist. The music of the Blue Mountains is slow and sad. The game masterfully uses the music and the cold blue colors to create a sense of loneliness in the player. This level style is used for the leftmost tiles, and they slowly begin to evolve, like the blue mountains begin to evolve the further right you get on the board. By the time you make it out of the leftmost tiles and onto the middle of the board, the enemies will have made their way to you, and we can get into them now. Mogura is the first one I encountered, and before I start talking about him, I would like to preface this by saying that every single sprite made in the Godzilla creepypasta was dramatically improved upon, and it is unreal. The developers didn't have to do that, given that the existing sprites were already pretty dang good. I say dang. I'm family friendly like that. Cut to a corpse. The original sprites were good. They would have been fine if they were used, but the developers of this game took the extra mile and made everything even better than it already was. With that out of the way, on to Not Mogira. Not Mogira is not at all like regular Mogira in that it's actually hard to fight. It moves around fast, is good at zoning with its drill arm and its tail blasts, and can devour your health bar with its signature face drill. Taking him down causes the screen to glitch, and you can see regular Mogira appear for a split second before disappearing. Not Gazora is definitely my favorite new monster just because he looks so unusual and disturbing, but also kind of funny. So funny, in fact, that I wrote a smiley face into the script. His music is the same as regular Gazora, but randomly slows down and speeds up. He quickly steps back and forth while doing three things. Grabbing his own head and squeezing his brain until bubbles come out, slapping you, or super slapping you. It is hilarious how much damage the charge slap does. It's all well animated and is in equal parts silly and terrifying. Just how I like my monsters. Like Not Mogira, when Not Gazora dies, he briefly returns back to normal before disappearing. After defeating those two, Titanosaurus attacked me, but then subsequently disappeared. In the original story, he just flat out disappears, but in this, he isn't truly gone yet. When you reach the right side of the board, the blue mountain tiles start to become more alive, and I'm saying that with massive air quotes. Now standing in your way are actual blue mountains that you have to knock down to progress, each yielding a little blue power-up. Occasionally you will run into these skeletal blue humanoid reptilian creatures that tightly hug the mountains. When approached, they will fly away and cover their face in their hands. They will then begin to start crying uncontrollably, their tears hurting the monster you play as. Hurting them will cause them to look shocked and scared and killing them will reduce their bodies to tears. These guys are called Grievers, and they are a huge pain to deal with if you are Godzilla. This is the one time you want to choose Mothra over Godzilla because she can just camp and mash the X key. Then there are the yellow levels, covered with disgusting yellow tumorous eyes that turn to watch your every move. Swarming enemies include these flying Matango and walking Matango, Matango walls and dripping ceilings. I do not like these levels. Also, by the way, look at this image. No words needed. Next, we get to the blue caves. The blue caves are these huge, sprawling caverns with cyclopean birds called weepers if you're Mothra, and buffalo rats and crystal crabs if you're Godzilla. The music is somehow even more depressing than it was earlier, but that doesn't make it any less of a bop. On the ground, there are objects that give you power-ups like barrels, skulls, and cold, blue, dead bodies curled up in the fetal position. There's also a red weeper that just flies by and gives you a card. He's a little guy. We'll get to the cards at the end. What interests me the most about the blue caves is the paintings in the background. In the background layer, there is a set of randomly generated paintings that can appear. 
Paintings of note are this red smear with a blue creature running from it, three blue creatures seemingly offering gifts to a bronze creature, a blue creature bestowing a familiar golden humanoid to another blue creature, and the same red smear gripping a green creature in front of the three blue creatures that appear to bow down. There's also this, which I don't really know what's happening. I see what looks like the blue creatures praying, the red creature but in baby mode, and some various other colors. I adore how the red creature is conveyed as some indescribably evil entity that can't even be drawn. And if you know, you know. And if you don't know, don't worry, you'll know. At the end of the caves, there's a mini-boss simply titled The Giant for no discernible reason. He attacks by punching, kicking, and throwing rocks, and his only weakness is a furious flurry of nut punches. Do not let up until he simply ceases to exist. On this board, there are a couple of special maps, one of which being the Blue Jungle. The gun towers from earlier now twist off of their pillars and become these fast-moving hand creatures. In this level is the entrance to a fungal cave. Inside are grey corpses that can get controlled by flying Matango. When controlled, they become really hard to deal with, taking little knockback and walking Godzilla to the left side of the screen. Your best bet is to keep the Matango from infecting the corpses before they become a problem. At the end of the cave is a colossal boss called the Blight. The Blight is a stationary threat that shoots eye beams and summons endless swarms of blue Matango. When its giant orange eye receives enough punishment, it pops out its socket and starts trying to chomp occasionally retreating back to place so that way it can put down more Matango zombies that can very easily overwhelm you against the left side of the screen. After hitting the eye enough, the blight will eventually collapse and you can move on. The void is an interesting space. In the original NES Godzilla creepypasta, this space was completely empty, so whatever it was supposed to be in the original story is unknown. However, this level in the game is a chaotic mess of misplaced textures, bugs, glitches, and worm creatures. Occasionally a swirling glitch will fly toward you. Interacting with it will cause the UI to glitch out. The music does well to fit the place and is titled Less Than Empty, a reference to the fact that the level tile was completely empty in the creepypasta. It also makes use of something called a shepherd's tone. A shepherd tone creates the illusion of endless swelling of sound in order to build tension and make you uncomfortable. At the end there's this shifty eye mini boss. He spits little fuzzies, and when he dies, the outline of his eyes remain. That's epic. The final unique level is one that I speculated to take place on the inside of lungs, and when I looked it up, yeah. There are these weird nautilus head guys named Hotheads and Jellyfish, and strangely enough, Titanosaurus. Cool. Meet Ghost Titanosaurus, a stronger version of Titanosaurus with transparent skin and muscle tissue. His moveset is near identical to regular Titanosaurus, save for the horn beams spawning jellyfish this time, but it is really nice to see that the developers decided to go the extra mile again and re-sprite, code, and animate Titanosaurus two times, both times being amazing. Anyways, on to Biolanti. Biolanti starts out in her flower phase, having little tendrils spitting venom at you, or poison, I don't know giving you little love bites with her tentacles if you get too close. Halfway through, she regains her health and transforms. When she transforms, the beat drops hard, and we segue into a song called Too Much Fertilizer. Nice. Violante is easily the most difficult boss, with the most pain to throw your way. From biting to spitting to skewering, she's really hard to deal with, but any good masher should be able to get through. When killed, she explodes, with her body slowly fading. And now... The moment we've all been waiting for. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I present the Red Chase. In the original story, the protagonist beat the Hell Beast Red by holding right and not getting grabbed. Here, it's an endurance run of evading and not getting tricked. You're started in a scorched area with tall, sharp mountains and tall flames. The monster you chose now has the ability to go both forward and backward. After exactly 5 seconds, a low bellowing roar will play, and a giant black silhouette will flash by. And for the first time you see him. Now the rules of this game are simple, right? Just don't get grabbed, idiot! Well at first it will seem that way, but then red disappears with a glitch, reappearing on the other side. Now this is where the fun begins. Don't panic, don't get tricked, and always be on your guard. If you get ambushed, he will devour your monster alive. This will certainly have adverse effects on the economy. 
As time passes, he gets visibly more and more frustrated. He'll get more cunning, tricking you in new ways. Standing still and waiting on one side just to reappear on the other, or switching sides without a glitch. I love it when he just stands still and wait with his mouth agape. The goal of this chase is to wait for the fire to burn out. Red getting increasingly aggressive until eventually, this happens. When the fog settles, he will be at his most aggressive. He will employ every one of his tricks to catch you, and I swear, this is one of the coolest, most panic-inducing parts of any video game I have ever played. But eventually, the fog dissipates and the word run disappears, leaving your monster alone in the dark. Alive. And then the game ends. Yeah, it gave me but a taste. The game is amazing, but still, there's so little of it to enjoy. But for what we did get, though, we got a game that didn't just be what the story was. It wasn't just the creepypasta, but playable. It was its own thing, its own identity. Alone, all one. Alan. These people know what they're doing, and I'd like to use this platform to commend them because it's good. The NES Godzilla Games Discord server's most recent post is from March 19th of this year, which tells me that they still have plans for this four-year-old project. So, to the NES Godzilla creepypasta team that are working on this game, I just gotta say, take your time. What we have so far is exceedingly impressive, and I am very excited for the future of this project. But we're not done yet. Using the cards you received in the campaign, you can play custom game. In the custom game, you can enable cheats, enable crazy random events, and play an assortment of characters, including Titanosaurus, Mogira, Mothplane, Tankzilla, and my favorite, Gazora. Nova Cream 31, please do explain why Gazora is the best kaiju ever. Gazora has a simple game plan, jump forward and mash the attack button. A game plan so simple even a two-year-old smack in the keyboard can do well with this kaiju. He takes absolutely zero, he takes zero knockback, he can heal himself, and has the dumbest fucking attack animation I've ever seen. This game plan of holding forward and mashing is perfect for people such as I, NovaCream31, who dedicate the rest of their brain space to doing complex mathematical calculations. If you think about it, Gazora takes a lot more skill than you think. Anyways, penis, 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 penis. Thank you, NovaCream31. Very cool. All the kaiju are pretty straightforward. It's exactly the same as their boss form, except you can control them. Mothplane and Tankzilla are funny, but their charm wore on me. The challenges of custom mode are cool. They add a lot more chaos to the already chaotic game of NES Godzilla. Like the aforementioned black holes and spawning mini-bosses in the middle of nowhere. All in all, this is a wonderful game, is free, and it deserves your attention. And that is all for the purpose of this video. You may have noticed that the audio quality is worse. That's because I moved to my grandma's house and this room is not acoustically optimized whatsoever. You see, most channels as they grow improve in quality, but here on the Pig Pig channel we do things a little different. So like the video if you enjoyed, thank you for watching this far, and uh, subscribe right now!